Hello, I'm Sarah Coates. Thanks for joining me. We begin on the Israel-Gaza border, where more than 1,000 Palestinian demonstrators have gathered along the border fence, as today marks the last Friday of the Muslim month of Ramadan. The leader of Hamas in the Strip, Yaya Sinwa, is threatening to use what's known as Jerusalem Day next week, which recognises Israel's control over the old city following the 1967 Six-Day War to attack Tel Aviv and other cities in Israel. Sinwa saying US President Donald Trump Trump wants to sell Jerusalem to the Zionists without paying a price, adding that Palestinians will be demonstrating in numbers not seen before. Sinwa reportedly went on to say that Hamas has improved its capabilities since the last war with Israel back in 2014. And let's go now to our defence correspondent, Daniel Semach, who is standing by on the Israel-Gaza border. Daniel, thank you so much. Tell me, what is the situation there on the ground at this hour? Well, Sarah, in the last hour and a half or so, there has been an uh, escalation, at least in regards to the numbers of people that have arrived and uh, instances where there were some attempts made by Palestinians along the border to damage the security fence. From what we understand, the Israeli military says there are around 4,000 Palestinians protesting at the typical five flashpoints. Now, if we take a look at the border itself, uh, right now it's relatively calm. This is what was expected by Israeli security forces and officials, that it would be a handful of thousands, up to maybe 5,000 that would arrive here today in the last couple minutes we actually saw the IDF using heavy amounts of tear gas along the security fence. There are reports um, from Palestinian uh, Palestinian reports of at least two injuries of Palestinian protesters. Just before you came to us we also did hear some uh, ambulance sirens that were sounding off on the other side of the border. So definitely some activity on the border but not nearly uh, as active as we've seen it in several in the past several weeks. Although last week it is important to say was also a very calm day even with this happening during the holy month of Ramadan, which in past years has seen an escalation. For now, things are relatively calm, but we have seen a few instances of violence along the border. So, Daniel, like you said, uh, the last few weeks have been relatively calm. Tell me, can we expect these protests today to escalate? Well, we'll have to see what will happen in the hour or so to come, but uh, only an hour more, really, of uh, this protest continuing, given the fact that mostly uh, those families that are that are there or other Palestinians will be uh, celebrating, commemorating the end of the fast, of the, the they've been fasting throughout the day during Ramadan on a daily basis. So generally speaking, these Friday protests as of late end in the next hour or so, uh, it's unlikely that we'll see any activity overnight. Those night confusion units that were active in recent months have not been active at all in the past few days, in the past few weeks, and even in the past two months or so. That being said, as you mentioned, Sarah, upcoming Jerusalem Day is a day where we have seen demonstrations happening, not only here along the Israel-Gaza border, but obviously also in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank. So it's possible that we could see some activity along this border. We heard from Yehia Sinwar, who did make some, threat, some threats, but that rhetoric is generally typical before uh, commemorative days such as the one coming up on Sunday. And Daniel, we are here hearing now that an arson balloon in southern Israel uh, has set uh, a large field on fire. There is a fire out of control right now. Tell me, with uh, what Sinwa has been saying and with Jerusalem Day, how prepared is the IDF, is Israel, uh, for further escalations? Well, one, one concern, one major, major security concern today that I heard from one security official, a local official here in southern Israel, was that there would be incendiary balloon launches. And because of that, the Israeli fire department has been on high alert, especially in the southern region. There have been 45 fires that have taken place throughout the month of May. That really has continued. It's a sort of aggression that Israel wanted to see stop. But given the heat and given the, also the weather conditions, it's been pretty pervasive, at least in the past two weeks or so, the, as recently as yesterday. And indeed, we are hearing reports of fires that have started today. Um, we don't have official confirmation that one of the fires that started really nearby where we're currently standing was caused by an incendiary balloon. But that is the initial understanding from uh, the security forces, it, the IDF and the local fire department that arrived at the scene there. That is definitely something that Israel is still concerned about and the fire department is preparing for. And on the other hand, the Israeli security forces throughout the West Bank and along the Gaza border, whether it be the Israeli military, uh, special forces or 
more in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. You also have the border police are certainly on high alert, at least until this coming Sunday. This is the last Friday of Ramadan. It can, in the past, it has been a day where we've seen demonstrations, but it has to be said that so far today, at least in this part of Israel, uh, this has not been a very, very active day that we've seen in recent months. Obviously, in Jerusalem, on the other hand, there was that terrorist attack was definitely an active day, and the security forces will be on high alert there specifically in light of what's expected to be an active day on Sunday. Daniel Semak on the Israel-Gaza border. Really appreciate the update, and we'll come back to you a little later in the evening. Now to Jerusalem, where two people are injured, one in a critical condition in a stabbing attack in Jerusalem's old city. A 50-year-old man was injured when he was stabbed near Damascus Gate, while a second victim was attacked near the Hova Synagogue in the city. The Israel police say that officers at the scene shot and killed the suspect, who's a 19-year-old Palestinian man from the West Bank. And our defence correspondent Jonathan Regev was there and filed this report. It was a very eventful day here in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas. It started here inside uh, the Damascus Gate right uh, behind me at a very early hour of uh, the morning. A Palestinian man approached a Jewish Orthodox man, stabbed him and injured him uh, critically. Uh, that man later fled into uh, the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem and was able to stab another teenager before he was shot and killed by uh, police officers uh, on site. Later on in the day, two Palestinians tried to infiltrate into Israel from the area of Hebron, that's south of Jerusalem. One of them was shot and killed by forces in the area. Another one was injured. And as you can see, Tens of thousands of people uh, attended the Friday prayers. This is the last Friday of the holy Muslim uh, month of Ramadan. They uh, came in in uh, the late hours of the morning and then are coming out in uh, the afternoon. A very sensitive uh, day here in Jerusalem and another sensitive day coming up on Sunday. This is when Israel marks Jerusalem Day, the day that marks uh, the unification of uh, the city that happened 52 years ago in the Six-Day War. Police uh, will remain in in uh, very uh, high numbers here in the city. Never a dull moment, as it seems, in the city of Jerusalem. Jonathan Regev, I-24 News. Demonstrations throughout the Middle East today, including Lebanon and Iran, over Jerusalem Day, or Quds in Arabic, with thousands of Iranians marching against the close relationship between the United States and Israel, with senior Trump administration officials in the region trying to drum up support for its peace plan between Israel and Palestinians. Demonstrators in Tehran setting fire to American and Israeli flags, along with burning effigies of Donald Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Top Iranian officials also in attendance, including President Hassan Rouhani and Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif. The people in our region and the world are harassed by Trump's and the United States policies, which are trying to dominate the will of the people. Today there is a broad rejection to Trump's decision to annex Jerusalem and consider it as the capital of Israel. In Saudi Arabia, another message to the regime in Tehran with King Salman telling a Gulf Arab meeting that Iran's development of nuclear and missile capabilities and its threatening of global oil supplies poses a risk to regional and international security. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have lobbied Washington to contain Iran. They also say they want to avoid war with Tehran after drone strikes on oil pumping stations in the kingdom and the sabotage of tanks off the coast of the UAE. It has to be noted that the lack of a clear and decisive action against the sabotage activities of the Iranian regime in the region is what has led to the increase and escalation in the way that we are witnessing today. We call on the international community to carry out its responsibilities towards the threats that the Iranian actions pose against security and peace and to use all means to stop the regime from interfering in the internal affairs of neighboring countries. And we're going out for a short break, but when we come back, as Israel sets to vote again, we'll take a look at the latest polls and what it could mean for Prime Minister Netanyahu. All of that and more, stay with us.
politics, economics, business and technology. Get the real news and the real insight about what's happening around the world. Michelle McCory breaks down the top stories of the day from the Middle East to the U.S. Weeknights beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern. Michael, what happened to TV news? Hell of a first question. You're trying to shoot the stand-up and the, the guy comes behind you and he's yelling Baba Booey. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, or, 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 or worse. worse than that. Steve, did you kill Elvis? The world thought I was Jack the Ripper. IT Center is an IT software and consulting company that develops and supplies communication and security solutions for the service provider industry. Voices is our unified communications collection of products with a groundbreaking hybrid architecture that grants flexibility and virtually unlimited control. From standard maintenance and support to specialized consulting, our offer can be customized to serve any size of organization. Working with us brings efficiency to all your communications. Every day, everywhere, everything connected. What you need to know, the news, fast and to the point, and the in-depth interviews that will keep you in your seat from the people that you trust. I-24 News presents The New Rundown, co-hosted by Nurit Ben and Kalev Ben David, only on I-24 News. Thanks for staying with us. Now, in the fallout of the Israeli parliament's vote to dissolve, Labor Party leader Avi Gabay has announced that his party will be merging with left-wing party Meretz or the opposition Blue and White Party. Speaking at a convention in Tel Aviv, Gabay said that the Israeli left should run with three parties instead of five in order to give the centre-left bloc a bigger advantage over the ruling Likud. And for more on all of this, let's bring in our diplomatic correspondent, Ellie Hockenberg. Ellie, thank you so much. So can we expect the left to merge for the first time and what shape would that take? Well, uh, Sarah, according uh, to recent uh, polls and of course the results of the previous uh, elections, uh, if the left uh, wants to uh, be a, 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 you know, a factor in changing the political uh, landscape, uh, merger might uh, very well be a good uh, step in this respect. But it's important to mention Avi Gabay is on his way out as the leader of the Labour Party. It was already made clear uh, to him, so it's not up to him to decide whether uh, this uh, merger will actually take place uh, or not, even though, again, a very feasible uh, option. A lot of back and forth in uh, the past week. Let's take a quick look at uh, the report uh, recapping uh, what happened in the current state of affairs, and we'll continue from there. The gloves are off. Israel is heading to elections again, and the race is already getting dirty. Lieberman is the national toppler. He is a serial toppler of right-wing governments. He is ready to take an entire country and throw it into a tornado of elections, to take us into needless, expensive elections. There's no connection to the right. There's no connection at all to any political worldview. It's about a cult of personality and not a political worldview. The head-to-head -head battle between the allies turned foes, Benjamin Netanyahu and Avigdor Lieberman, is likely to be a main motif in the upcoming campaign season, but not just that. Say goodbye to vanity lists, fringe parties and minor ideological nuances and welcome joint political forces. If there will be more than three parties here, then it's not going to work. It won't be worth anything. So it's clear there have to be mergers. I think either the Labour Party with merits or the Labour Party with blue and white. That's what needs to happen in the final analysis. Potential mergers are also expected among the Arab parties and on the other side attempts to create one big right-wing front to avoid the loss of votes as smaller parties fail to make it through the electoral threshold last April. 
And with the comeback to elections come the comeback of polls. According to a Channel 13 poll, the ruling Likud party would win 36 seats despite merging with centrist Kulanu. The main opposition, Blue and White, would win 33. Lieberman's Israel Beitenu party would enjoy a small boost from five to nine seats, but it's a big question whether he could sustain that. The union of right-wing parties, Shas, United Torah Judaism and Chadash Ta'al, all on seven, merits on six, labor plunging to four, Ram Balad on four as well. All in all, their right-wing bloc would get 66 versus the 65 seats it won in April, but by September 17th, it's anyone's guess where the balance of power will lie. Eli Hochenberg, I-24 News. So, Eli, uh, Netanyahu blames Lieberman for the collapse and vice versa. Could it be that both leaders gain power from this political spat. Yes and no, because at the end of the day, they're uh, fighting over the same or rather mm -hmm. similar electoral base. Uh, so uh, what Netanyahu will try to do is get as many votes as possible at the expense of a Victor Lieberman, who, let me just remind you, uh, Sarah, got only five seats in uh, the previous elections in April. This is far from being a remarkable number in Israeli politics. So from Lieberman's standpoint, after barely making it into parliament in the previous time to trigger this uh, political crisis in which he is now being perceived as a political match to Netanyahu might turn out to be a very wise move. And also now uh, running on the ticket of the secular vote, uh, right, underlying uh, this uh, part of his agenda vis-a-vis -vis the ultra-orthodox uh, parties, that was the official reason for the crisis uh, after all. So Lieberman, uh, for his part, will try to take a chunk of uh, votes uh, from the centrist blue and white party, again, on the secular ticket and uh, some uh, votes uh, from the right, maintaining his uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, or uh, rather uh, Soviet-descended uh, electoral base, while uh, hoping uh, to get uh, to gain more uh, power uh, at the expense of the ruling Likud party and the smaller right-wing parties. Ellie Hockenberg, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Now to the rise of anti-Semitism across the globe and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is coming out to express how concerned he is about a recent warning to Jewish people in Germany over a statement an official in the country issued advising people about the danger of wearing a Jewish skullcap, otherwise known as a kippah, in public. The German government's commissioner on anti-Semitism, Felix Klein, making those comments during an interview with Pompeo, who's currently in Berlin, worried about the message that that sense, telling journalists, none of us should shrink in the face of prejudice. Israel's president, Reuven Rivlin, also weighing in, calling it a capitulation to anti-Semitism. Now, in the ongoing trade dispute between the United States and Mexico, US President Donald Trump said Thursday that Washington will impose a 5% tariff on all goods from Mexico starting June 10. According to the White House, the tariff will rise to 10% on July 1st, then increase by 5% increments each month until topping out at 25% on October 1st. Daria Albinger has the details. President Trump taking to Twitter on Thursday announcing a new tariff on Mexican imports, writing, on June 10th, the United States will impose a 5% tariff on all goods coming into our country from Mexico until such time as illegal migrants coming through Mexico and into our country stop. The decision coming the same day a group of more than 1,000 migrants was apprehended crossing the border illegally into El Paso. The president has accused Mexico of failing to do enough to stop the surge of Central American migrants. In April, nearly 110,000 migrants were stopped crossing into the U.S., including a record number of 40,000 children, something the Trump administration is trying to crack down on. In a conference call, acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney said the tariff will gradually increase. That means taking the tariffs to 25 percent. That means taking the tariffs to 25 percent. We hope, sincerely hope, it does not come to that. Thursday's decision also comes on the heels of an escalating trade battle with China. Last week, the White House announced $16 billion in relief for farmers and ranchers hurt by tariffs levied against China. The uncertainty rattled Wall Street and left many worried since the cost of tariffs are ultimately paid for by American consumers. Mexican President Andres Lopez Obrador sent a letter to his American counterpart, Donald Trump, saying that he does not want confrontation and calling for dialogue with the US on migration. The letter came after Trump announced tariffs on goods coming from Mexico that he says will remain in place until the flow of illegal migrants coming to the US is remedied. 
Reports of executions in North Korea, Kim Jong-un's regime has executed its special envoy to the United States on spying charges. South Korean media reporting on Friday that envoy Kim Hyok-chol was executed by a firing squad in March at the Miram airfield in Pyongyang. Now, this comes as part of efforts by Kim to purge the country's top nuclear negotiators after the breakdown of his second summit meeting with President Trump. The report adding that four officials of the North Korean Foreign Ministry were also executed. North Korea has not reported any execution or purge of top officials in recent months. The President of Austria has appointed the country's first female Chancellor to lead an interim government until elections later this year. Bridget Beerlein, the head of the Constitutional Court, will now be tasked with forming a cabinet after the previous government collapsed over the Ibiza-gate corruption scandal. President Alexander van der Bellen praising the 69-year-old judge for taking on the role given the unprecedented circumstances. Earlier this week, the government of Sebastian Curse was ousted after losing a motion of no confidence in Parliament. Curse of the Austrian People's Party was the first Chancellor since World War II to be toppled in such a vote. Tel Aviv today was taken over by thousands of demonstrators marching, some half-dressed, decrying rape culture and the objectification of women. The annual so-called slut walk aims to make the point that women should be able to wear whatever they want without being sexually harassed. Our international affairs correspondent Bianca Zanini was there. This is the Tel Aviv slut walk a yearly protest, part of a global international movement, criticized for being too provocative and too controversial and praised for having one strong message. And that's really what this is all about, one message, that rape culture and victim blaming needs to end. So the South Slot Walk is basically an event to protest rape culture at large and false perceptions of sexuality and the misleading notion that there's no need for consent when touching or engaging in any type of sexual activity. While the slut walk began in 2011 in Toronto when a police officer said something along the lines of, well, if women don't want to be raped, they shouldn't dress like sluts. You cannot say this is because she wore a shirt skirt, this is because she was drinking, it's because she was hanging out with men. That's no excuse for hurting women. That's no excuse for blaming the victim for what happened to her. Thousands of people have gathered in Tel Aviv in support of this protest, chanting no means no means no. I come to support uh, rape uh, victims. And, uh, everyone uh, dresses as they wish and as they feel comfortable. I think that the message is amazing. And many here are proud to call themselves sluts, essentially sending a message that whatever a woman chooses to do with her body is her own business. Bianca Zanini, I-24 News, Tel Aviv. <laughs> Technology reinforcing memory. Young Israelis are trying a new approach to Holocaust remembrance and combating denial. Digital answers to the mounting question, what to do as a generation of survivors fades away? I-24 News tech and innovation correspondent Ari 11 Waldman takes us inside to find out. Never forget, two words with a generational challenge. First-person accounts of the Holocaust are dwindling. So some people are looking for technical solutions. We are developing uh, an, an interactive uh, VR experience that demonstrates the Birkenau uh, camp. Rothenberg is participating in a two-day hackathon in Israel, the second of its kind. His team from the Israeli army has digitally recreated a death camp for modern people to witness. The goal? To produce ideas for preserving memory and not let historical revisionists and genocide apologists capitalize on the information void. A topic that um, a lot of people here talk about is Holocaust denialism. And this is a huge topic these days, and the trend is, is rising fast. And the problem with that is that it's very hard to persuade people who are convinced of something. Mordechai's plan is another technological one, facial recognition. A user can upload a selfie to his site, and a photo of a similar victim will be displayed, along with that person's story and manner of death. Mordechai says it allows people to connect emotionally, investing them in the reality of history and making them less susceptible to revisionist claims. It's the right tool to use. 
in order to start solving problems. And when you don't do that, when you don't try to solve them, they're just staying there. Um, a hackathon is a tool used quite a lot in the tech ecosystem, in the innovation ecosystem, but not on other sectors of life. Now, Holocaust education is one such place. Many of these projects rely on making digital copies of primary sources, documents and first-hand accounts, and making them easily searchable. And there is now talk of doing the same abroad. Um, I think this is more relevant for Germany because in Germany we see memory fading. In Europe in general we see uh, the Holocaust being instrumentalized uh, for political reasons and, um, and remembrance uh, is a very symbolic act. Similar events currently on the drawing board for both Austria and Germany and keeping the torch of remembrance lit for another generation. Ariel Evan Waldman, I-24 News. And that is all we have time for for this edition of I-24 News. I'm Sarah Coates. Thanks for watching.